to be back. I can assure you, I, I never want to miss church and the opportunity to preach, uh, but, uh, but I never know when I'm going to be able to and uh, when I'm not. I can't see the future. I, I suspect you can either, so we don't always know what's going to happen. And uh, we look back over this past year, and there have been many surprises. Some of them have been wonderful. Uh, I, 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 even as I talk about these, I, I can just think of this surprise and that surprise and get a phone call and something wonderful happened. Uh, and then there are, the, are those surprises that are very painful. Uh, at the beginning of last year, we didn't know some of our dear folks wouldn't be here today. You just look around and I think back over these however many years, 36, going 37 years, whatever that I've been here, and I can just point to different places where now that's where she used to sit, where he used to sit, and they're not here anymore. And just this last year, uh, several of our loved ones has gone home to be with, be with the Lord. And I say that because here on the threshold of a new year, it's only natural that we we wonder what might happen. Something's going to happen, we just, we never know. And the more I thought about this, the more I prayed, I asked the Lord to give me a, help me to have a message, Lord, that comes from you that'll help those folks that are here today. I don't want to just preach uh, I, I want to preach what God puts on my heart. And even when we don't understand it, that's always helpful to someone. Yeah. There have been times, you know, I've looked at situations and I thought to myself, you know, it'd really be a good time for a sermon about this or that or the other. That, that, you know, that's what I need to deal with. But I don't always get it right. God never fails. And I believe... Uh, I believe that uh, this message this morning is exactly what God put on my heart. We can't prevent problems, but we can prepare for them. If you'll turn over to Matthew chapter number 26, or chapter 6 rather, this is a part of the greatest sermon ever preached. Began in chapter 5 and continues through chapter 7, and here we are right in the middle of it. We live in a time where many folks are fighting fears with all of the bad things going on. They feel like their fears are justified. We think about the war in Israel and all of the other strife that's going on in different places around the world. And then we look at our more immediate situation, our local community. We look at our family and our neighbors and our church and we think about those that, that are in need, and we think about how many times that, uh, well, the picture is not a pretty picture. It doesn't look good. Uh, there have been those that have given up seemingly. They, they can't see any hope. They're worried sick. And in their mind, they feel justified in, in being overwhelmed with fear. Uh, and I don't want to sound rude or uncaring, but let me tell you, we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live like that. We don't have to live our life with an attitude of fear. Now, I know it's just natural based on all of the stuff we see and what happens to us personally. Uh, it's just natural that we think about what might happen, but we can't see into the future and thank God we can't. That's one of the things we need to thank God for that we can't see in the future. I, if I remember right, Pastor's pen last week, I wrote about that. We can't see in the future. We, uh, we can't know what's going to happen tomorrow. James chapter 4 tells us you know not what, uh, what shall be on the morrow. We, we don't have any idea. We all have a future, however. We don't know how long it's going to be. I mean, for some, you know, they might live many years. For others, it's be a few. 
There are some that might be a matter of months. Might be some that will be much more brief than that. One of those surprise, sad announcements that we hear about. It's all of a sudden someone's here today and they're gone tomorrow. And in light of, in light of all of this, we need to ask ourselves, how are we going to spend our time? How are we going to spend our time? Are we going to sit around and wring our hands and worry ourselves sick about the things that might happen? Or even over things that we see that are, that are dreadful. There's, there's horrific things going on in this world today. And even here in this Houston area, those, those of you, we've got several cops that are members of the church. And uh, they can tell you of horrible, horrible things that's going on right in our own community. The things that, you know, we're blinded to. We never see that, that side of life. But it's there. And we can't change it. How are we going to respond to it? Curl up in a ball and suck our thumb and cry ourselves to sleep, maybe. But that's exactly what the devil wants us to do. Here in this chapter, in the beginning in verse 25 is where I want to start and we're going to look at this in sections because it's very clear as we read this that the Lord's desire is for us to not be fearful of the future. We talk about facing the future. Sometimes, you know, it, the things seem to go from worse to worse and just never any end. For those of us that are older, you, we start worrying about our, our, our children, our grandchildren, don't we? We don't want to see them go through what, what's coming down the road. Sometimes we forget about the fact that the young people have some fears also. I'm talking about times of desperation in their life. They might just be a teenager, but there are things that trouble them deeply and especially especially if they tune into the world and listen to the news and all of the stuff that's going on in the world, at some point in time they've got to ask themselves, what kind of a future do I have? You listen to the political debates as we head down to, toward the presidential election, and boy, you're going, you're going to hear everything imaginable. And it's all about somebody lying about how they're going to fix something. They're going to take something bad and make it something good. They never do. They make all of those promises, and yet every year it just keeps getting worse and keeps getting worse. And it's not just the news. It's by way of a modern-day technology that we feed ourselves on. When I say we, I'm talking about people in general. Most everybody got a phone in their hand or they're sitting in front of the TV or uh, reading a newspaper or whatever. And, and every harebrained idea imaginable finds its way into our homes through the Internet and all of these things. Yeah. And some of it seems so logical, so sensible. Uh, sensible. It, it, it seems like there's somebody that really knows what's going on, really cares about what's going on in my life. And, and people buy into this theory and that theory. And after a while, they find themselves out on a limb that they don't know where they are, or what's going on in the world. So the question is, what can we do? How can we find the faith to face the future without fear? Notice in verse number 25, here's, here's the first thing I want you to notice about the Lord's message. That he gives us a word of instruction. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body. What ye shall put on is not the life more than meat, and the body more than remnant. Now, just reading that to the natural man, you, 
they're thinking, what in the world? Take no thought, you know, to my life and what I eat and what I drink and what I wear. Well, you, are you kidding? Those things are important. And they want to argue against this. And the Lord said, don't take any thought about that. Don't worry about that. Don't fret about that. And think about the people in the ancient world, by the way, who were much more prone to worry than we are, especially when it came, comes to the matter of, of food, for example. Today, we can, we got all of these modern day preservatives and everything imaginable, and then we've got refrigeration, we can freeze it and keep it and eat it later. Uh, back then, they didn't have any of that stuff. They could find themselves in a dire need, I mean, in a heartbeat. What do we, uh, they were hunters and gatherers, and, and if they didn't get out and get it, they didn't have it. And here comes the Lord along and says, don't worry about those things. Of course, here in America, we're more focused on luxuries than we are about our necessities. Because we think we're not really living if we don't have more than all of the necessities. The necessities don't satisfy most people in America today. We want more than that, better than that, bigger than that. You know I'm telling you the truth, and, and I'm not talking about just the world in general. We Christians fall into that trap. Well, I got this, but, but it's never big enough, never good enough. Why? Because somebody else got something bigger and better, and you, that's what you want. We fret over these things in our life, and the Lord says, don't do it. We tend to forget about our need of God. We lull into a false sense of security, thinking everything's going to be all right when it's not. It appears here that the Lord is giving us an impossible command. That's that's the way I would look at it as an unsaved person. This just doesn't seem possible. And as we go on reading through this chapter, you'll see what I mean. It, it doesn't seem possible that we wouldn't be justified in worrying about all of these things. And the Lord yet forbids us to worry. And we go ahead and do it anyway. And I, you know, I, I, I can't help but wonder, why is it that we don't take this command as serious as the other commands in the Bible? Whenever the Bible tells us to be content with such things as we have, we slough our shoulders at that. And I, well, yeah, I, I know it's just human nature. It's just human nature that we all want more, that we're never quite sad. Yeah, and that's the problem. We just accept human nature as being okay when it's not okay. And the Lord gives us all of these different commands. Thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. Boy, we check off the list. We're, we're good at that. And he gets down here and he tells us, we're, don't worry about anything. Over and over and over again through the scriptures, we're not to fret, not to worry. And we go ahead and do it anyway as though, as though it's uh, quite all right with God and it's not. Israel had exactly the same problem. I don't have time to read it. When you get home, you ought to read Psalm 78. They had exactly the same problem that we do today. And so the Lord gives them a word of instruction. And getting through whatever difficulties we face in this upcoming year, or dealing with whatever difficulties you already find right smack dab in your lap and you can't do anything about it, getting through these things depends upon your attitude toward the instructions that God gives Because they're always good. They're always right. Now look at verse 26. And down through verse number 30, we see a word of illustration in these verses. In verse number 26, and I want you to think about these men as they were sold out, dedicated, following the Lord. And he says, Behold the fowls of the air, but they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? 
Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? My dad was 5'8", muscular bound. He had those real knotty kind of muscles from working in the timber when he was a boy, and I mean strong. And, and I always wanted to, for whatever reason, we had magazines back then, and you older folks remember those Charles Atlas poses, you know, and I tell them big old biceps. And, and when I was a kid, that, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be six, six feet tall. And I, I just had to get there. I thought I'd never be a man if I don't get six feet tall. Well, I'd measure myself, mark on the wall, you know. Finally, I reached it and got a little, little bit past that. And I thought, I arrived. my daddy was twice the man I, I would ever be. And he was 5'8". We worry about and things like this that don't matter. He said, how can you add an inch or a cubit unto your stature? You can worry all you want, but it's not going to make you any taller or any better. In verse 28, and why take ye thought for raiment, that your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, to, which uh, today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? That must have seemed like a slap in the face to them, O ye of little faith, because these are the men that said, we have forsaken all to to follow the Lord. And by the way, they had as far as they possibly could. They were followers of the Lord. And, and yet he says, O ye of little faith. Notice these two illustrations. In fact, in these verses, he deals here with several areas of anxiety. In verse 19, it was finances. Verse number 25, it's food and fashion. It, and boy, I mean, that's top of the list for a lot of people, food and then the fashion. And then he deals with the future, and we'll look at when we get down to verse number 34. But notice, in these two, in these two examples, he starts with the, the birds of the air, the fowls of the air, in verse 26. And, and by the way, the birds are seldom idle. I mean, if just being busy could get the job done, you know, that wouldn't be a problem. They're seldom idle, uh, all, always busy. But they're not bothered as we are. You, you know, whenever we think about the, the question that many ask is, 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 is there really a God? Is there really a, a divine spirit, a divine being that created the heavens and the earth. I'll tell you, if you'll just study nature and you'll be honest about it, you'll be forced to come to the conclusion that there must be a God. There must be a designer, a creator. All of these things could not possibly happen. And especially when you look at wildlife and you think about the birds of the air and the instincts that God has implanted in them. It's not like they sit out there on a twig somewhere reasoning, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? Or, boy, it's getting cold. I wonder if I uh, ought to find a warmer climate. God's got that all under control, right? And they respond to those instincts there. There's a little old poem I'm sure that most of you have heard said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush and worry so. But the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Well, that makes a good point. Because some people live is to leave the impression that there is no God. That's, that's the way they live. That if there is a God that, you know, he's e either doesn't care or he's sick or, or just not unconcerned about me, I, that, that's the way they live. Because there's constant worry and fret over these things. And, 
And the Lord's saying, look at, look, at the, look at the birds. Think about that song a while ago. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. You know, so many times we sing those songs. Let me tell you something that will help you out. Get you a hymn book and spend some time in the evenings or mornings at home. Read the words. I almost got up in the middle of that song and asked Brother David if he would sing a certain verse again. Just to emphasize each and every word of that verse. We sing because we're happy. We sing because we're free. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. That's the point that the Lord is making here to us. We need not worry God taking care of the birds of the air. And then in verse 28 through 30, he talks about the flyers out in the field. The flyers can't do anything. Oh, I know they absorb the sun, the rays of the sun and the moisture from the ground, but they have to accept whatever comes their way. If it doesn't rain, there's nothing they can do about it. If the sun doesn't shine, there's nothing they can do about it. They're in the constant control of God. They can't do anything. You know, you and I have been enabled by God to do certain things that he expects us to do. Don't expect God to provide your needs and put food on the table and a roof over your head if you're too lazy to work. God's not going to drop it in your lap that way. God has given us the ability to do things. But think about the, the grass and the flowers. They, they just planted there. They're unable to do anything. God's given us abilities that we can use, but there's always a limit to our abilities. Listen carefully. John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, Without me, you can do nothing. Amen. All of our effort is in vain without the Lord. And if we know in our heart that we're following the will of God for our life, we don't have to sit around and worry because the Lord forbids it, number one. Number two, it's unreasonable for a child of God to worry about things. It's unnatural. It's unprofitable. It's like someone said, it's, worry. it's like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but uh, it won't get you anywhere. You sit there and, and, and rock. It just doesn't go anywhere. But it's worse than that. You see, worry doesn't just delay you. It will distract you from what you ought to be doing. Yeah. It'll discourage you. Eventually, literally destroy you, whether it is emotionally or, or whatever, it will destroy you. It has an effect upon your physical well-being. It has an effect upon your mind. It has an effect upon your testimony to others. That word, Greek word translated worry means to divide. It's like a divided mind. And I often say it's like the mule that starved to death standing between two haystacks. He couldn't make up his mind which one he wanted to eat out of. And that's what worry does for us. It literally will destroy us and ruin our testimony. Uh, testimony. James said, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Amen. So it affects every area of our life. Aren't you glad that the Lord has given us a word of instruction that alone shows that he cares. And then after the instruction, he illustrates it. But then we come down to verse 31. And here we see he gives us a word of inspiration. Notice in, in verse 31 and 32, the Lord says, Therefore, I, I wish I had time to just talk about that. Therefore, I underlined that in my Bible. Therefore. If you want to know what that word therefore is therefore, 
just think about what we've just been talking about. Just go back to what Jesus said. Therefore, because of all of this, because the Lord takes care of the birds of the air and the flyers out in the field, therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all of these things do the Gentiles seek. In other words, that's where their focus is. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. We don't have to inform God about it. He already knows about it. So whenever we think about being in this wicked world that is so troubled, we can rest our trouble so upon these exceeding great and precious promises of God. And what he just says here is, is absolutely certain. We can know that God knows exactly what we need. There's no question about it. You see, whenever we, when we pray for something, it's not like we're, that we're informing God uh, about something because he already knows about it. Amen. Say, Lord, I've got this problem. Uh, yeah, he, he already knows about it. It's fine that you mention that problem, but you're not informing God. He knows about it. And by the way, he cares. So many times if, the Lord doesn't respond immediately and exactly like we think he should. We think, well, he's just not getting the message or he really doesn't care. It's how sad that is. He cares for us. Let me tell you, you and I don't always know what's best for us, but he does. And if you don't believe that, you've got a problem worse than your problem. Really, you say, well... You don't know, preacher. I've got a serious health problem. Yeah, okay. I, I've got a domestic problem. Me and my spouse, we're about to split up and go our separate ways. But I'm telling you, those kind of problems can be solved. But if you've got the problem of, of not believing in your heart that God knows and that God cares and that God is able, that problem's bigger than any of the other problems that you've got. Because it's only through our confidence in God that we can find the courage to confront those challenges in life. And they're going to come up. I started the message the way I did on purpose because last year at this time, we didn't, we didn't know that these dear loved ones was going on to glory. We didn't, we didn't know some of you were going to be diagnosed with certain things and Boy, it's hard not to comment when I look around and I see and I know what some of y'all are going through. Or not, in, not in the sense that I understand it, but, but there are people going through some really, really difficult things here in this building today. It all gets back to the question of what are we going to do, how are we going to deal with it? And that's what the Lord's trying to show us in these things here. And he's giving us this word of inspiration, letting us know. He says, therefore, because I take care of the flowers of the field and the birds of the air, because of that, stop worrying about these things. But notice in verse 33, this is conditional. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Naturally, the first condition is to have God as your Father. There is no good outlook for you if you're here this morning and you've never received Christ as your Savior. If God isn't your Heavenly Father, if your sins haven't been forgiven, if you're not on your way to heaven, there's not a good outlook. Look, you might have... A, a million dollars in the bank. You might be the most popular person in town. You might wear the finest clothes, have the world at your feet. But if if you're not a child of God, you don't have anything. Amen. Nothing. Amen. So these wonderful promises that the Lord has given us here about about how we deal with the issues of life, the unpleasant, painful issues, are conditioned upon us, what? Seeking first 
the kingdom of God and notice in his righteousness. Yeah. I mean, even after we're saved, there are conditions that that Christians have to meet. We can't just live in the way we please, but you don't say, well, you know, I'm a child of God. God's my father. I know I'm going to heaven and and then turn around and live as we please. You've got to be a child of God, but a child of God in the will of God. That's why I always say that success can be described simply by as finding and following the will of God. That's what success is. Wherever it takes you. And it takes people in different places, different directions in life. God didn't call everybody to preach. God doesn't give everybody the ability to play musical instruments. We, but God has something for all of us to do. And even after we're saved, Brother Kenneth and I, as, as pastors, we're not allowed to do anything we want. There are certain things that are conditioned upon. We can, we can do things that would render us uh, unfit for the office of, of being a pastor. We're to be blameless. We can't expect God to supply our needs unless we meet those conditions. And look at verse 34. We find inspiration in the comfort. Notice, there, take therefore, there's that word again, take therefore, no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, the very fact that Christ tells us not to worry about tomorrow tells us that it can be done. Remember I said earlier, it seems like an impossible command for the Lord to tell us, don't worry about anything. Take no thought about that. And if you'll be honest, there's some of you probably thinking, well, that, you might be able to do that, preacher, but I can't. I got a bigger problem than you do. It just seems impossible. I'm telling you, regardless of how it seems, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ tells us not to worry, it tells us that it can be done. It doesn't mean that we're doing it, but it can be done. The Apostle Paul said he had learned to be content in whatever state he was in. There was a man that suffered more than you and I can imagine. Even as he's writing these letters to the churches, he's imprisoned. He's been beaten. I mean, beaten to, beaten to the point that about to die. See, there doesn't seem to be any bright future for him. But oh, if we could talk to him. He learned to be content. Paul wasn't sitting around wringing his hands, crying, pitying himself. I wish I could sit here and tell you, look, I'm just like I, I'm just I, I'm just, just like Paul. I I don't ever worry about anything. I'd be lying if I said that. I fail probably as much as many of you do but that doesn't make it right doesn't mean we ought to excuse it and I'm trying to get you to see that there's hope for you and for me and for all of us we don't have to worry ourselves into an early grave Amen. Jesus commanded it that means that it's possible the good news is he has a he has a promise for every problem we face. Because a lot of times we get the idea that our problem is unique. Nobody else, nobody else understands what I've got. But whatever it is, there's a promise in the Bible that, that fits the problem you've got in your life. Embracing those promises is the only thing that's going to really cure our troubled heart. As I said, comfort comes from us having confidence in Christ and anything other than that's just a false hope. 
We worry about tomorrow, and we need to we need to focus on living in the present. Leave the past back there where it is. Live in the present, like the old song says, "One day at a time." That's the way we got to learn to live life one day at a time. I can't do anything about what's going to happen tomorrow. I, I, I can look. I can look on my date book and look and see this is scheduled and that's scheduled and but all of that can change I can't control any of it Hebrews chapter 13 says in verse number 5 let your conversation that's your manner of life your behavior your conduct be without covetousness well that's hard isn't it and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And then in verse 8 he says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. These these precious promises of God's, get this, this is a precious promise of God's perpetual presence with us. The same yesterday, today, forever. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. There'll never be a time when He's not there for you. I underlined those words. I don't know whether you caught on to it or not as I was reading where he says, for he hath said, he hath said. It's not something that Brother Kenneth preached. Brother Kenneth said, Brother Stone said this. He hath said. This is God's guarantee. God can't lie. He never fails. You ever buy something that's got that lifetime guarantee with it? Lifetime guarantee. If it ever fails, ship it back. You get a brand new one. You know what? They know that a year or two down the line, that company is going to close its doors and open up as another company Or go bankrupt. I tell you, when God gives a guarantee, you can count on it. He never goes bankrupt. He shall supply all your need according to, not out of, shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. It's unlimited. Regardless of how much he gives, it never lessens what he has available. You say, well, how can that be? He's the creator. He's our God. He is our father. For he hath said. You, you can depend on God whenever he says, look, don't worry. I take care of the, of the birds. I take care of the flowers. And I care more about you than I do them. I'm going to take care of you. If you're a child of God in the will of God, Mark it down. God will be there every moment in the most dire need of your life. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Adoram Judson, the famous missionary to Burma. I guess my favorite missionary book was To the Golden Shore. I've given away several copies of it and Adoram Judson was a man who absolutely uh, suffered unbelievably. His wife and children, think about it, the things that he lost. And there in Burma, thrown in prison, separated from his, from his wife at that particular time. Beaten and mocked. And they often would say to him, mocking him, how does your future look now? Kind of like ancient Israel where the heathen said, where is your God now? 
And they said to him, How, how's your future look now? His answer was always, as bright as the promises of God. And if you're a child of God in the will of God, I don't know what's going to happen to you. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'll be able to preach next Sunday. I don't know if who will be here and who won't. But I know if we just keep doing what we know God wants us to do, there's no reason for us to sit around and make things worse by worrying about it. Because we don't have the power to control it or change it anyway. It's all in God's hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Aren't you glad? If he's not your father, we invite you this morning to receive Christ as your Savior. And if God is your father, and may you, you didn't intend for it to happen, but some way along the line, there was a time that you were so on fire for God not worried about anything. You was busy doing the will of God in some way or another. You got distracted. And rather than seeking God and his righteousness now, you, you're focused on other things. Wouldn't this be a good day to come back and say, I just need to rededicate my life to the Lord and take my hands off and give me my life like a blank sheet of paper to the great composer saying here, you write the script, Lord. Remember, he's the one that taught us that we are to pray what? Not my will, but thy will be done. You're, you're on safe ground when his will is done. Let's all stand together. Father, I pray this morning that, that you'll accomplish something here this morning that would bring honor and glory to you, something that would bring relief to your children, something that would give, give folks a, a sure anchor to hang on to as, they, as we go into this new year. I pray, Lord, that during those times that Satan would try to steal their joy and rob them of their peace and strip them of their dignity and even entice them to sin, that they'll stop and think about these words from our dear Savior. They'll think about the assurance that they can have in God's care for them and that they might be comforted. And Lord, if there's those here today that have never been saved, I pray this morning they'll put their faith and their trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus and leave here knowing that their sins are forgiven and that heaven is their home. But we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.